Shalom from Israel. I'm Shira Sorkaram, and I want to welcome you to Israel Frontline, your guide to Israel and the Middle East. We want to give you information you will probably not hear in the mainstream media regarding life in Israel and the Israeli-Arab conflict. And we'll add a biblical perspective to our reality. Today's program is the second in a series of four looking at the historical facts as they really happen concerning the question, is Israel a legal nation? Today we will look at some little known documents concerning the case for the legitimacy of Israel's existence. On the program today, how to answer claims that Israel does not have a legal right to exist documents you might never have heard of before. Finally, we will get our panel's Israeli perspective on these documents and resolutions and the promises from the Word of God. You may not be accustomed to watching a program discussing historical treaties, but I believe this is very important because I have information about Israel that you most likely have never heard. If you love the Bible, and you read the Bible, you are familiar with scriptures like the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. It would be natural for you to think, yes, I know the Bible says this, but what about the poor Palestinian refugees who are victims of Israel's renowned military power while Israel illegally occupies Palestinian land? For that reason, I'm going to show you historical facts that no one can deny unless they rewrite history. So you can find these facts which are documented in history books and on the internet, but which few people know about. So here goes. What legal right does Israel have to exist? In case this question seems ridiculous to you, Know that there are 1.6 billion Muslims who for the most part believe that Israel should not exist. There are also Western intellectuals, professors and philosophers who think that Israel's existence is simply too painful for the huge Muslim world to have to suffer. And so it would be better if Israel disappeared. That is why I'm going to show you the legal documents that give global legitimacy to the state of Israel. The first evidence has to be from the Bible. Yes, the Bible was inspired by the God of Israel and its word is eternal. It is the reason that after 2,000 years of exile, the Jewish people have now returned to their land. Here is the first mention of Israel's heritage found in the book of Genesis. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. Many times the Bible repeats this promise, like in the book of Psalms. He has remembered his covenant forever which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac. Then he confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion of your inheritance. Perhaps you already know these scriptures, but what about the legal documents concerning Israel's existence written over the last 100 years? The Balfour Declaration is the modern foundational declaration for the establishment of the present Jewish state. England and France had just won World War I against Germany and its ally, the Ottoman Turks, who had ruled the entire Middle East for 400 years. Here's a quick review. Britain and France divided the Ottoman Empire between themselves. Britain took a large swath of territory from the ancient land of Israel to Mesopotamia. At that time, in 1917, 
Britain promised Israel a homeland. Here is a portion of that document. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. The British were referring in this last phrase to Arab countries where Jews were in danger of persecution. A quick reminder from last week's program. Palestine is the name that Rome gave to the region of Israel's biblical inheritance back in 135 AD in an attempt to destroy forever the nation or even the name of Israel. Three years after the Balfour Declaration, the San Remo Resolution was passed. On April 25, 1920, the San Remo Conference was held. It was an international meeting of the post-World War I Allied Supreme Council, attended by the Prime Ministers of Britain, France, Italy, and Japan's ambassador. Stay with me now, because the more violent Palestinian behavior becomes, the more you're going to hear voices saying Israel has no legal right to exist. But here is an incontrovertible fact in the San Remo Resolution. The mandatory, and by the way, when these documents say mandatory in relation to Palestine, it means Great Britain, which held the mandate. So I will replace the word mandate with Britain in these documents. Quote, Britain will be responsible for putting into effect the Balfour Declaration originally made in November 1917 by the British government and adopted by other allied powers in favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. End of quote. The forerunner of the United Nations was established in 1920 and called the League of Nations. It confirmed the mandates of Great Britain and France, and it confirmed the necessity to give communities in the former Ottoman Empire their own states. The Council of the League of Nations resolved the following. Now listen to this. Whereas the principal allied powers have also agreed that Britain should be responsible for putting into effect the Balfour Declaration originally made on November 2, 1917 by the government of His Britannic Majesty and adopted by the said powers in favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Whereas recognition has been given to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home in the country and confirming the said mandate of Britain defines its terms as follows. The administration of Palestine shall facilitate Jewish immigration under suitable conditions and shall encourage, in cooperation with the Jewish agency, support settlement by Jews on the land, including state land and wastelands not required for public purposes. Did you notice that the nations of the world specifically recognized the Jewish people's historical connection to the land? A fact that the Islamic nations today deny. In 1945, the League of Nations was replaced by the United Nations. On November 29, 1947, a historical date for Israel, the UN passed one of its earliest resolutions, Resolution 181, 
ratifying the Jewish people's dream of having their own country. Resolution 181 declared, Britain shall use its best endeavors to ensure that an area situated in the territory of the Jewish state, including a seaport and hinterland, adequate to provide facilities for a substantial immigration, shall be evacuated by the British, who were at that time occupying the Holy Land, at the earliest possible date. The resolution continues, when the independence of either the Arab or the Jewish state as envisaged in this plan has become effective and the declaration and undertaking as envisaged in this plan have been signed by either of them, sympathetic consideration should be given to its application for admission to the membership in the United Nations. Resolution 181 was adopted with 33 in favor, 13 against, including all the Muslim countries in the UN at that time. 10 abstained, including Great Britain, who had a one-of-a-kind opportunity to have a God-given part in re-establishing the nation of Israel, just as was promised by God himself. Almost every British household had a Bible filled with God's promises to the Jewish people. They have no excuse for turning their backs on Israel. What a lost opportunity. Incidentally, the city of Jerusalem was supposed to become a special international entity under the administration of the UN. However, in the 1948 Arab invasion against the newborn state of Israel, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan grabbed the old city of Jerusalem and ruled it for 19 years. When Israel accepted the UN resolution and declared its independence on May 14, 1948, it followed that the UN declared Israel a member of the United Nations. Here's how portions of Resolution 273 read. May 11, 1949, noting that in the judgment of the Security Council, Israel is a peace-loving state and is able and willing to carry out the obligations contained in the Charter. The General Assembly, acting in discharge of its functions under Article 4 of the Charter and Rule 125 of its Rules of Procedure, 1 decides that Israel is a peace-loving state which accepts the obligations contained in the Charter and is able and willing to carry out those obligations. Two, decides to admit Israel to membership in the United Nations. This is the way Israel became an internationally recognized state according to international law and a legal member of the United Nations. Is Israel legal? What do you think? Next week, we will explore the reactions of the Jews and the Arabs to the United Nations vote to grant Israel membership into the UN. Stay with us and we will be back shortly to discuss these documents and scripture with our panel of Israeli guests. One of Ma'o's major activities is hosting nationwide conferences for Messianic believers and leaders in Israel. Events like Equip Conferences for Leaders, the Israel-China Kingdom Destiny Conference, and Promise Keepers Conferences help Israeli believers grow in faith and advance our vision. These conferences also establish strong connections within the worldwide body of Messiah and provide tools to reach the lost, from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Welcome back. We now turn to our panel of guests for their Israeli perspective regarding these important documents and Israel's right to exist. Today in the studio with us are Mati Shoshani, Director of Operations for TBN Israel and from Jerusalem. Shani Ferguson, a co-founder of Yeshua Israel Ministries, also from Jerusalem and Israel Pachter, 
pastor of Beit Hallel Messianic Congregation from Ashdod in southern Israel. Welcome and thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's great being here. Shani, I have a question for you. What would you say to anyone who scoffs at the scriptural defense of God speaking to Abraham saying this land is yours? A, a lot of people would just say, well, that, that doesn't count at all. So what would your answer right. be to that? I would say that assuming Abraham was just delusional and just walked across the, the land and found a plot of land and decided to take over it and you know the children of Israel come out of Egypt into that land uh, and let's say they were all uh, ruthless and they just took over and they just you know conquered the, the people that were there, they are still the most recent people group in existence to have lived and taken over that land. So even if God didn't promise us that land. They were there. They were historically there. Mm -hmm. They um, lived there. They built up. I mean, archaeologically, there's Over history. A years. Historically speaking, Israel is the only people group, the the most ancient people group that still exists that lived there. Mm -hmm. right. So, if you want to talk about, you know, who has the most um, ancient deed, I would say the children of Israel. And there are no existing people groups from that time period still in existence. You know, I went to the Bible and I wrote down the names of all of the uh, peoples that lived back in that time that don't exist anymore. Listen to this. Rephaim, Zuzim, Amin, Amalekites, Amorites, Kenites, Knessites, Kedmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Gershagites, Jebusites, all of these, including the Philistines. Including the Philistines. I think that's a very important point yeah. because uh, the, the Palestinian um, term, it, you know, is basically Arabs trying to claim this ancient Philistine heritage. And in point of fact, the Philistines no longer exist, have not existed for thousands of years. So that claim is, is bunk. Well, and the Philistines were not even... Uh, Middle Eastern people that came from the they weren't, Adriatic but they did essentially area. live in, in Gaza and in Ashdod. But they came, okay, the so they from came the north. Yeah. So let's say they had some sort of right. They just aren't around anymore to claim that right. right. So the, the Palestinians are not. I mean, they are, but they they have no lineage with the Philistines. Yes. Let, right. let me just comment that the Jews are not the only people who like to look back four, five, six thousand years back and say we come from this nation. This is something that exists around the world. Mm -hmm. And many people take pride in the fact that they are the same people who've lived in the same land for, you know, five, six, seven. Well, give an example. Th the Chinese, yes. the Egyptians, mm -hmm. the Indians. The Germans tried to in World War II. They were not very successful because their history wasn't impressive compared to the others. Mm -hmm. uh, the Greeks, there are many people who like to look back and say, you know, we've been here for millennia you know right. we have this story whatever their belief mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. we have the story mm -hmm. the only the, the thing unique about the jews of course is is that we left and came back came back where most people if they leave they never come back okay. that's but that's what you should really, also note that there were always jews left here even when they were exiled they course, left the there was poorest a small core. jewish yeah. people here to tend the land but as a people we, yes. we left and two thousand years later came back most people never made it back that's the sort of the underlying story so, Israel Pachter, historical facts clearly show that nations around the world in the turn of the 20th century recognized the need and the justification for the creation of the state of Israel for the Jewish people. So what went wrong, even in the League of Nations and even in the early days of the United Nations, they saw this need. And now, what went wrong? Why does the West today see Israel in such a negative light? Yep. It's very interesting because really before uh, Israel became a state, all the European countries, almost all of them, they voted for that. And the society in Europe, they understood they have right to be here because of what happened to them, but also because of the Bible and history and the background of, uh, and the history of Jewish people in the land of Israel, or Palestine, or different times they call it differently. Uh, but today, we can see how European nations are changing. They have changed a lot in many ways. And one of the basic changes is actually uh, Bible, 
or respect to the Bible and biblical history. You know, uh, 60 years, 70 years back, the European society, all of them, if, with all the differences, they were uh, believing Bible societies. And they were they called to... themselves Christians. Today, right. they yeah. talk about the post-Christian Christian. Europe, right? Right. And this is the, one of the biggest changes. And as a pastor, as a spiritual uh, person, I feel very sorry for that, but it's a fact. And uh, in other questions, what we can do with it, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And of course, second question, it's also the modern society. You know, people doesn't like history today, and uh, when we're speaking about Israel, mm -hmm. you really cannot make right conclusions if you doesn't know history. Mm -hmm. Even just check it 10 years, 20 years back, and you will have totally different perspective. Yes, so people just right. watching TV and they thinking and making decisions and conclusions what happening today and why it's happened and what was the history, nobody cares. I mean, most of the people, they don't, they have no time for it. And of course, uh, tolerance is one of the big things. When people feel this group is strong group and another group is smaller group or weaker group and the strongest one dominate, they feel compassion because of the modern society, character, mm -hmm. uh, because of the tolerance and they feel sorry, sorry automatically for right. those who are smaller, who are victims. Right. But right. Uh, actually, it's not full picture. We can, you can see Israel as a huge country controlling a little piece yeah. of Palestinians yeah. or very, very little country in the huge, big yes. Middle East right. surrounding. You know, Mati, um, I have this feeling that Israeli young people know mm -hmm. a lot more about history because of the dangers around us than, let's say, young people from Europe. I really question whether the typical 20 or under uh, European knows anything about history at all. Now, maybe I'm mistaken, but... What you're describing is actually characteristics of large nations. The bigger the nation, mm -hmm. the less, the, the lower their awareness of what happens in the countries around them. Right. So, if a country such as Germany, France, you know, that have tens of millions of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of citizens, yeah. they don't actually think about the history of smaller countries. Israel, as a tiny country, eight million mm -hmm. citizens, mm -hmm. we think about the history of everything that happened around us because we have to. Yeah. So, and just to put things in perspective, Israel was born when you think internationally out of the almost the, the terror of the uh, Holocaust. Uh, everyone in Europe, you know, comes out of the war at the end of 1945, knowing that they have they've been, essentially tried to annihilate a people, mm -hmm. and this you know this mindset of we have to give them some kind of solution because they're not safe was very prevalent. I want to comment and say, I'm not sure things are as bad as they appear to be. In other words, people say, oh, Israel's attacked. Let's examine it. Are we actually boycotted internationally? Not really. We're still part, a trade partner, an industry partner, mm -hmm. a military partner, a Members political partner for, for most countries in the democratic world. Mm -hmm. And if you want to look at a country that isn't, look at what they did to South Africa. We're, not, we're nowhere near that. Look mm -hmm. at what, they, what they're doing today to Iran and other right. countries. They're trying to get us there. The, people are talking about it, but in, in reality, I mean, I'm not saying things are perfect and rosy. They're not. I'm just saying in perspective, people speak negatively about it. The reality mm -hmm. is as long as the common interest remains, and it does, we're still not in that bad of a situation, just to be right. entirely fair. Right. However, it doesn't seem like it's getting better. Would you say it's getting better um, in any way? Is Israel gaining more friends or, um, you know? I just think Israel is, I mean, is, is Israelis by default, because of the way life is, specialize in working ways around problems. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if we have a tank out in the field, so to speak, we're not going to, you know, when it breaks down, we're going to take it in and get it fixed or whatever. We stick like, you know, some duct tape or some, like just mm -hmm. fix it with, right. with what works. So Israelis will find ways to find investors in like countries that, that don't care about politics or whatever. Right. They just find ways around. So yeah, there's yeah. people that don't like us and we work ways around and find okay. uh, new but, people. But there are global trends and Israel is part of that. We, I mean, we're outside of the narrow interests of most countries, you know, mm -hmm. except for our neighbors, obviously. So if you think about Europe, they're a dwindling economy, generally speaking, yes. most of those countries. They don't have the money or the energy to deal with problems in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S., some, in certain instances, the same could be said about that. Right. But on the other hand, we're finding new friends in the East. Yes. So, and those are emerging economies, right. people, and also countries that are, you know, not predominantly, yeah. but many of them are coming to right. faith. Christianity yeah. is emerging, right. and our relationship with them is getting much right. tighter than it used to be. 
So Israel, Israel Potter, tell me, you come from the former Soviet Union. What, what is Russia's take on Israel? Are, are they uh, for us, against us, uh, don't care? What's happening there in Russia? It's both. One, what they feel, and one, what they're interested to express publicly. And, you know, as political situation changing, uh, the opinions, official opinions are changing. But uh, generally speaking, uh, here and there, there are some exceptions, but generally speaking, the relationship is pretty good. Mm -hmm. And uh, Israel, of course, not interested to have Russia against them, but also uh, Russia interested in Israel. And even Mr. Putin, the President Putin, uh, many times expressed his desire to help and support or be in touch with the Russian Jews who left the country. Yes. So it's, it's not bad, it's pretty good, I would say. Well, <laughs> well, I have one last question, just about 30 seconds, which I think is very interesting. You know, it's always talking about the illegality of Israel. When, when Britain and France took over the Ottoman Empire, do you think that was a legal thing, Matthew, to do? That's more than 30 seconds of an answer, but just, <laughs> just to be clear, people like throwing out statements. It's illegal, it's against international law, yes. and to be very, very you know, uh, frank about the whole thing, you know, legal and illegal is often a question of power. When you're the one with the power, yes. what you do is legal, and when you're one, the one without the power, what you do is illegal. Yes. So if you asked at the time Britain and France, they were doing God's will and humanity's will, taking over the Ottoman or the nine uh, Ottoman Empire. Yes. If you would look at it in today's, uh, in the light of today's international mm -hmm. law, international law says the use of force yes. in any situation is illegal. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom right. line. But right. people still choose to use force. So. Good. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you, panel. And uh, we'll see you next week. This is all the time we have for today's program. Thank you for watching, and we hope we were able to give you insight which will keep you informed and help you pray for Israel in a more focused way. For more articles about Israel, sign up to the free Maoz Israel Report at maozisrael.org slash sign up. Please join us next week for the third program in the series of four examining whether Israel is a legal nation or not. We will present the Jewish and Muslim responses to the UN declarations and the result of their reactions. On behalf of all of us at Israel Frontline, blessings and shalom from Tel Aviv.